I was very pleased yesterday when uh, Professor Dasbaz and uh, Justine mentioned social sustainability because uh, um, it's a topic, you know, people have talked about the environmental impact and they've talked about economics, but they don't often mention the social aspect. And um, a lot of the questions in the discussion we finished up with yesterday afternoon centered around social inequality and uh, people being left out, if you like, of society. Um, we've, we've already seen this picture this afternoon. Um, we've got the three elements of the economy, society and the environment, and really, to achieve sustainability, we want them to be in some sort of harmonious relationship as a certain amount of overlap, so that um, we, can, uh, we can function in a sustainable way. Um, it seems to me at the moment, the way the world is at the moment, uh, these, I mean the whole lot's in a bigger circle that obviously represents uh, our glo global system as a whole, but it seems to me at the moment that these elements have been driven apart. And I thought, well, you know, why? What are the things that have driven that? Because earlier in man's existence, he did live in a sustainable way. And one of the first um, problems that came to be noticed was something, I was very pleased when Neve made the point about planting 35 million trees in in Ethiopia because one of the first things that people noticed was deforestation, people cutting trees down like there's no tomorrow. Um, at the time man moved from the hunter-gatherer to the farmer transition about 11 or 12 thousand years ago there were about six trillion trees on planet earth. Today it's about three trillion. We've chopped off them and down and while we're sitting here some characters in the Brazilian rainforest will be cutting some more down, I've no doubt. Um, so, uh, I thought, well, let's, let's just look at how um, humanity's developed over the, over the years. I mean, these are approximate dates. Um, these transitions didn't occur um, you know, 11,000 years ago, it would be a gradual process that occurred over time. I mean, hunter-gatherers learned to, um, the first proto-villages that archaeologists have discovered in England were located near areas of woodland and water, and the people were hunter-gatherers, but of course they, they built their little group in a place where there was plenty of scope for fishing, hunting, gathering nuts and berries and all the rest of it. Um, and then, at some point, uh, man decided that he could do well if he marked out a plot of land, cleared the weeds and everything, and planted a crop. And that represented um, a transition from a, a low per capita energy consumption to a higher level, because he was actually sequestering all of the solar energy that fell on that piece of land and therefore all the photosynthetic activity that took place on the piece of land. Um, moving on, somewhere about 1500 on the Iberian Peninsula, the Spanish and the Portuguese decided to set out and try and tap the wealth of the Orient. The Spaniards went west and the Portuguese eventually succeeded in travelling down the west coast of Africa and around the Cape to India and as a result of that fabulous wealth accrued to those two countries. Um, the arrival of the conquistadors was a bit of a disaster because they brought a lot of European illnesses, measles and uh, influenza and stuff that the natives weren't proof against and it's been estimated that something, there's various estimates, but a median figure of about 50 million people died at that point. And so a lot of farmland began to revert back to forest and the CO2 content took a bit of a dive for a while, which may have triggered a bit of a cold spell in Northern Europe. But uh, then, of course, the Spaniards decided they couldn't mine this silver and gold and they couldn't grow the uh, coffee and the sugar on the plantations that the Portuguese had also carved out an area in Brazil. And so they needed some more energy and they brought that in in the form of slaves from Africa, of course. 
Um, then we go on a bit further. Um, it says 1800 there. Uh, James Lovelock, in his latest book, points to the installation of Thomas Newcomen's atmospheric steam engine in a, in a coal mine near Dudley for pumping water out of a, of a deep coal mine. He says that was the start of the Industrial Revolution. He says that's the start of the Anthrop Anthropocene era. Now, as an engineer, I can't argue with that because for the first time, men were turning fossilized energy in the form of coal into mechanical power. I, as a metallurgist, I would want to say, okay, but you've got to add in another development that took place about 20 miles away in 1708 when a guy called Abraham Darby first succeeded in smelting iron with coke instead of charcoal. Why did he need to do that? Well, 500 years ago, people became very concerned about the way forests were being chopped down. In England, during the latter years of Henry VIII's reign, they brought in the Woodlands Act, which forbade all this random tree cutting. Uh, and they also noticed the same effect in Japan. Japan was in turmoil at that time. It was run by a gang of warlords who were competing with each other to build the biggest castles and the biggest palaces using wood. Um, charcoal is a renewable material. It's made from timber, of course. Coke, uh, is, which is what Abraham Darby used, is made from coal. Now, when they couldn't cut trees down in England, the iron industry became starved of its fuel and its reducing agent. And people, well, perhaps, perhaps we can use coal. So they used coal in the blast furnace, and they made the iron, fine. And as soon as they started to forge it, it crumbled like a, a shortbread biscuit. The reason was traces of sulfur and phosphorus present in the coal. And even high quality coal like anthracite will contain small traces of sulfur and phosphorus. It only takes a tiny fraction of 1% to produce this hot shortness. But if you distill the coal, drive the smelly gas off and the ammonia liquid and tar, you end up with coke, which is virtually pure carbon. And so, um, the unleashing of the, the iron industry, at the time Darby made his discovery, we were making about just over 20,000 tonnes a year. Within 150 years, this country was making 1.5 million tonnes of iron and steel, half of the world's total. It was an important transition because men went over in that, 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 that period from using predominantly renewable materials and energy sources to non-renewable material energy uh, sources, materials and energy. And that, that was a, a very important transition and that sort of triggered um, you know, the, the, the developments that have happened since. You can see the global population was, was sort of creeping up. And then 1950 you know, was a, another date where a lot of people talk about the great acceleration that happened. All sorts of developments really took off once things had settled down after the Second World War. And of course at that time the population was less than a third of what it is today. But this trend for increasing energy consumption, uh, you can see that's, 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 the, that's the trend we're obtaining. I'll just put a few figures down here for um, power ratings over the years um, moving forward in history and you can see there's New Commons engine uh, various figures which, which illustrate the fact that we've, we're using more and more and more energy and um, we're cutting ourselves off from uh, a, a knowledge of where all this lot comes from in a way now in England we, we banned cutting trees. Um, what, I, yeah, what, what I thought of doing was try to find examples. I said, 
are there any examples of people actually living sustainably in this modern world or until recently? And I've, I've found a number of examples of what were sustainable societies. And I thought, well, if I look at these, use them as case studies and ask the question, what did they have in common? Um, we might get a feeling for why social sustainability is important because if these were sustainable, the, so the social element must have been present. And what did it mean and how did it manifest itself? Um, the first place I found, I, I, I relied on the, the work of uh, Janet Diamond and uh, Raymond Firth and uh, um, Helena Norberg Hodge and people like that. Um, he uh, pointed me in the direction of this island, Tikopia. It's barely two square miles in land area, but it's been occupied for 3,000 years continuously. And it's, it's sort of 100 miles from Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. And all the people had was little boats. So you, they, if you took a trip out in a boat, you know, you've got more of a chance of not coming back than if you decide to climb Mount Everest today. It's, uh, and the thing is, what they found was um, they could support a population of 1,200 people. There was the, the resources of the island, there was a bit of rainforest, there was a lake, there was um, some, some uh, area, quite fertile, it's, it's in a moderate sort of latitude. Uh, and the people knew that they could, they could grow enough food to support 1,200 people. And they managed that for 3,000 years. Sustainability. How did they do it? Well, when you've only got 1,200 people, you can pretty well know everybody else. And it was a, it was a bottom up principle because they agreed among themselves that they got to limit the birth rate. They did it by contraception, they did it by abortion, they did it by infanticide by suicide and occasionally the couple of tribes would fall out and there'd be a bit of a scrap and people would die that way but they kept the population for 3,000 years at a sustainable level and they did it because they were all in agreement that their survival depended on them collaborating to do it. New Guinea Island, a much larger island, has been occupied for well over 4,000 years it was discovered 500 years ago, there's, a, there's a, a coastal plain covered by rainforest and the explorers from the Europe uh, found their way into the rainforest that the central highlands they never penetrated. And then in 1930, a group of biologists and mining experts decided to hire a plane and fly across the island just to see what it was like. And they took off and they got over the first range of mountains and then they were absolutely astonished to see villages with thatched roof huts and fields laid out with drainage ditches. Wow, it, it's been occupied and we never knew. So they made their way into the interior and they discovered a gang of people who wore next to nothing or a small loincloth. Um, and their, their assumption was these people are primitives. Um, they, they had drainage ditches coming out down the fields, vertically. You can't do that in Europe. <laughs> so they persuaded some of the islands to change it and just dig the ditches sort of horizontally. And of course, the ground became waterlogged and the next heavy rainfall, the whole uh, terrace system, the sweet potatoes and yams, just finished up in the river at the bottom. They also observed the New Guinea Islanders planting fruit trees and nut trees, which didn't actually mature for about 40 or 50 years. They did attract game animals. So they said, well, why are you planting these trees? Because you won't live long enough to eat from them. And the New Guinea Islands said, oh, no, it's not for us. We're doing it so our grandchildren can have something to eat. Intergenerational responsibility. That's a fundamental principle of sustainability. And these primitives, apparently, knew about it. And all the mulches and fertilizers that they used on this land, they recycled existing organic material. They didn't waste anything. They didn't produce piles of rubbish. 
the agricultural system that they had had been running for about 7,000 years. Sustainable. Um, it, again, it was a bottom-up principle. They didn't have any chiefs or kings or anything. They did fall out now and again out of scrap, and that helped to keep the population down to the mouths they could feed. For timber, they, they came across the, uh, there was a tree um, that grew very quickly and produced very uniformly grain timber that was very good. And so to minimize the amount of land they had to take up um, it, uh, with, with growing trees, they cultivated this particular tree. But their, their um, agriculture was extremely sophisticated once you started to look at what they were doing and ask why they were doing it. Now, a different example, and I'm not going to talk about all, but Tokugawa Japan was a particularly interesting one because that was um, an example of a state organized on the top-down principle. As I mentioned, Japan was in turmoil, um, and two guys, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi and uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, decided that you know, this internecine warfare had better come to an end. And so they, they fought battles and subdued the warlords. And then when they'd done that, uh, Toyotomi wanted then to sail off and annex Korea. And he wanted to annex Okinawa. And Tokugawa wanted, he wanted a, a land of peace and stability. So they fell out and they fought a last battle. And Tokugawa won. And the emperor appointed him with the title of Seitai Shogun, Shogun for short, in, 19, in 1603. But he also invested him with the power to rule. So, uh, and what Tokugawa did, he, he, he wasn't just a bit of a military genius, he defeated all the others, but he was an extremely wise statesman and a patriot because he really did have the interests of Japan at heart. He wasn't a kleptocrat or a nepotist or a get rich merchant. He, he really, uh, and, and if you read what he did, I, I, um, I went to Japan in, in 1991, I attended the Big Materials Conference. And on the last day I went to a place called Nikko where all the Tokugawa shoguns are buried and I wanted to find Eiyasu's tomb and there it is. Uh, I knew what it looked like. I'd seen a photograph of it. Um, it's well away from all the other tombs. It's a Chishuga Shrines complex. And I found it at about a quarter past one on my last afternoon in Japan, and I took a picture of it. I, uh, the more I've learned about this guy, the more, you know, I, he was an amazing guy. And uh, um, so what he did, he threw out all the foreigners. He sent all the Christian missionaries home. He closed Japan off. He forbade Japanese to travel anywhere else in the world. They couldn't leave the country. For foreign trade, the traders were allowed the use of a small island in Nagasaki Harbor at the end of Kyushu. Mm -hmm. um, and then, all there were 15 shoguns, Tokugawa's, until 1868. And they maintained the same principle. Japan was cut off from the world. There was an initial increase in population, but then it stabilized. And for 100, 150 years, the population, I think it only went up from 26 million to about 27 million. And then we know what happens. Uh, Commander Perry sailed into Tokyo Bay and demanded that they open up to foreign trade. Now, the last Tokugawa didn't like that, and there was a big argument, and there were people in Japan who wanted to open up, and there were those who didn't. And when the, a fleet came back, 17 warships, American, British, French, and Dutch, <coughs> and the last shogun sent out a, a fleet, and the, the foreign navy blew them out of the water. At that point, the last shogun thought, right, that's it, I've had it. So he went to the emperor and said, it's all yours again, pal. You know, so, so, and then they opened up. And within 100 years, they've got a population not of 27 million, but more like 130 million. And they've fought all sorts of wars and bombed Pearl Harbor and all that stuff. So, um, the point of this is, in each case, you've got a closed society. And you've got a, 
a society where everybody could see what the common good was and they were willing to support it and work towards it. Similar re remarks apply to uh, these people in Ladakh and, and the people on the, the panhandle of uh, Alaska, they, they've only ever lived by fishing so they didn't, they didn't suffer the same depredations that the, the Indians did, Indian tribes further east in, in, in America. Um, now, on this business of uh, the impact that we've had, I, I got these figures from a colleague of mine, Derek Bradley at the University of Leeds. Um, you might say they, these are old figures. Well, 1950 was the year that the Great Acceleration started, and uh, this is just a development over 20 years. And what we're talking about is growing maize, which is a high energy food crop. And these are the various energy inputs that go to produce the crop. And the first thing you can notice is, over the 20 years, the labor just about halved. And looking at the, the output, that slightly more than doubled. So you've got a, a labor productivity gain of four times, more than four times. And people say, oh, more efficient agriculture. But it isn't. Uh, if you actually look at the numbers and work out the percentage changes, which, which I did the other day, um, and then you look at the ratio of energy output to input, um, it's 3.18 there, it's less in this case. And of course, since 1970, people will be using more of the um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, these huge increases. Uh, so in other words, we're, we're pumping a hell of a lot more energy in to gain this extra um, energy value, but thermodynamically, this is less efficient. One American professor said, modern industrial agriculture is a way of using land to turn oil into money. And that's about it, I think. Um, now, <clears throat> what uh, the sort of conclusions I've come to are that, um, that there's, there's a bit more if you look at the paper. Um, the societies that were sustainable were free from outside influences. What we've done, I mean, all, all, since I've been at uh, Leeds back for the last 25 years, all people could talk about was globalisation. It seems to me we've globalised a lot of our problems, and we haven't globalised the solutions, or we haven't globalised a vision of what really we should be doing. And uh, these societies knew they'd got a finite space to work with, and therefore there was a finite number of mouths they could feed. Uh, and so, by the measures that I indicated, and it was the same in uh, New Guinea, and uh, in Japan, they, the interesting thing in Japan was, during that period of uh, population stability in the shogunate, uh, demographers have analyzed the, the data, and they found that the times when the, the price of rice went up, the birth rate went down slightly, when rice became a bit cheaper, the birth rate went up slightly, but only by a very small amount. So they were actually sustainable. Um, they devised strategies to keep their population at a stable level. In Japan, of course, it was the shogun. He had a vision of a sustainable Japan. They hadn't invented the word then, but if you read what he did, he very clearly had got a picture of a sustainable Japan. He knew what would work, and he did it. And people realized that they were being ruled wisely, and uh, they went on with it for 250 years. Um, these societies emphasize collaboration rather than the exercise and assertion of individual rights. And of course, in the West, we all talk about human rights. Nobody talks about responsibilities. And we should do. If you've got the right, you've also got a, an obligation to think about your fellow men. And that's where I think this is, the, this is where social sustainability comes in. At the discussion yesterday, a lot of it finished off yesterday afternoon with a discussion of social problems. And, and because we don't pay attention to that, 
these people fall through the cracks. And I mean, I'm not a member of the Communist Party. They they perpetrate as many environmental cock-ups as, as the capitalists. Tony Blair used to talk about the middle way. He never said what it was, but I think there is a middle way. And uh, some, somehow or other, we've got to we've got to realise um, the need for social sustainability because otherwise the the whole thing goes out of control. Um, the other thing with these societies was they exercised excellent stewardship of the environments in which they lived. Tikopia didn't become, become a rubbish tip. New Guinea didn't become a rubbish tip. Japan didn't become a rubbish tip. Lots of areas of the West, one of the most polluted areas on the planet is Hanford in Washington State where they made the first plutonium to drop on Nagasaki. It would take centuries to clear that mess up. Um, so, a few ideas on social sustainability. Thank you very much for your attention.